Good afternoon and welcome to Dahlgren Chapel of the Sacred Heart, the spiritual heart of our Georgetown University community. My name is Father Mark Bosco, the Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and on behalf of the university here with us today, I wish to thank you for joining us for our Dahlgren Chapel Sacred Lecture Series. Today we're honored to have with us Sister Donna Markham, President and CEO of Catholic Charities USA. Sister Donna, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Georgetown's Dahlgren Sacred Lecture Series was inaugurated in 2014 after the completion of the renovations of this beautiful chapel dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. With these sacred lectures, we continue a Jesuit tradition practiced by Ignatius of Loyola and his early companions. They would offer lectures outside the context of liturgy with the intent to inform and edify those seeking to grow in faith, hope, and love. Their sacred lectures dealt with scripture, but also engaged with issues of the moral life, with prayer, the person of Christ, and the challenges one encounters in living out the gospel in everyday life. Meant to be accessible to a wider audience, these lectures were a staple of Jesuit pastoral practice in both their schools and churches. In that same spirit and style, we've adapted the tradition to meet the needs of our current moment, seeking out distinguished speakers engaged with a range of topics, including spirituality, social justice, and the Jesuit intellectual and artistic tradition. Some of our guests have included the Catholic novelist Alice McDermott, the Jesuit historian Father John O'Malley, Sister Simone Campbell of the Network for Catholic Social Justice, and the dearly beloved uh, Father Howard Gray. Donna Markham is an Adrian Dominican sister and board certified clinical psychologist. Before becoming the president of Catholic Charities USA in 2015, and the first woman selected to lead the organization in its 109 year history, she was engaged at Mercy Health Systems, leading the transformation of the delivery of behavioral health care services across seven major geographic regions. Before that, she was served as president of Southdown Institute in Ontario, Canada, and was the prioress of the Adrian Dominican Congregation. Sister Donna's sacred lecture is entitled, Sharing the Journey with Immigrants, a Reflection on Human Goodness. Georgetown University's solidarity with the plight of migrants and undocumented persons has been a central focus of our research and advocacy over many years. Students, faculty, and staff have participated in Majus immersion trips to the Kino Border Initiative in Nogales, Arizona, and Mexico to see firsthand the many ways we can help make humane, just, and workable migration a reality. We are so grateful that Sister Donna is here with us to deepen this commitment by sharing her own sense of the spiritual transformation that comes with accompanying migrants on their journey. Donna, thank you again for honoring us with your presence and with your reflections. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sister Donna Markham. Well, it certainly is an honor to be with you to talk about uh, sacred journeys in this beautiful sacred space. As I was uh, beginning to think about what I wanted to speak about, it occurred to me that these days we've been so surrounded with cynicism um, and negativity and so much doubt in the capacity of human beings to be merciful and do what is right on behalf of the common good that it would be really um, important for me to share with you some good news. Uh, a story that is true, uh, I wanted to focus on a different narrative, one that speaks to the kindness of people across the continent of North America. My reflections are based on true stories and you should know that nothing that you're going to hear was illegal or in any way uh, against the law. So just to, just to say that up front. 
uh, for a bit of context to begin with. You know Pope Francis called all of us Catholics and people of goodwill across the globe to share the journey with our sisters and brothers who are migrants and refugees. These people on the move who are either internally displaced in their own countries or refugees who've had to flee their countries or persons who've migrated due to economic issues, drugs, gangs, uh, wars, etc. These are the people that Pope Francis really has called us to be very attentive to. According to the 2017 report of the UN uh, Commission, High Commission on Refugees, there are now over 60 million people, refugees and internally displaced people in our world. That figure doesn't count the people that are categorized as immigrants. When they're added into it, the figure is over 200 million. So Pope Francis is calling us to openness, to accompaniment, and to share the journey through relationship. And I must say that I, as a Catholic, am proud to be part of this incredible moment focused on our sisters and brothers who are really struggling to get by in life as asylum seekers, as refugees, as migrants. This certainly is a time when we can witness to our faith and Jesus' call to care for the stranger. Let me first uh, share a little bit with you background information uh, uh, about what's happened over the course of the past three years regarding refugees. In 2016, the U.S. had a ceiling of 80,000 refugee admissions. That year, the ceiling was reached. Catholic Charities is one of the main uh, serv service providers to the refugee migrant community as, they, as people enter our country. In 2017, the ceiling was set at 110,000 with 55,000 refugees admitted, or just about half the number that had been actually approved. In 2019, let's see, in 2018, the ceiling was 42,000. Less than half were admitted, 20,000. And this year, the ceiling has been set at 30,000, and we expect that we'll be lucky if 5,000 will be admitted, or one-sixth of the number that had been approved. So we are placing a burden on other countries to receive these people who are suffering so much as we have cut back on the numbers of admissions. Part of the issue is the tacit restriction of people coming from the Middle East. And another issue is the change in the nuance of who can claim to be an asylee, who can claim asylum. That has affected people coming across the southern border uh, where the Kino Border Initiative is. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. So a refugee coming into the United States, or a migrant uh, coming up across the southern border or trying to get in from uh, some of the other countries in the Middle East and North Africa, undergoes a series of rigorous screenings that actually takes years. And just so you have an appreciation with this, because we've, we've at Catholic Charities have had to accompany many people through this process. First, there's the UNHCR uh, determination that they qualify. Then a referral to the United States for resettlement. And at least then followed by three levels of security screening with a fourth additional screening added for people that are coming from Syria. Then the Department of Homeland Security does an in-depth personal interview with them. That's followed by three U.S biometric uh, checks by the government. Then there's a medical screening. Then uh, there's the matching of the refugee with a voluntary agency such as Catholic Charities. Finally, after all of that's happened, they may or may not be given admission to the United States. So this is a long, long process. Currently, it's, it's estimated that less than 
of those arriving legally through the southern border asking for asylum will be granted asylum. Less than 10%. Some of that is because of the redefining of what constitutes asylum. So gang violence is, has been taken off the table, then it's back on the table, and it depends on what day of the, the week it is and the month, whether that's, they're considered for that. There's a lot of uh, capriciousness in the determination. So when they're not, when, they're de when they are denied asylum, they're deported back to the country of origin. So Catholic Charities is one of the major charities that's caring for them uh, while they are waiting a hearing. If, they're, if they're, they get uh, released from detention, usually they're ankle braceleted and they're set up with a sponsor family waiting hearing, which could be uh, anywhere from six months to a year. Uh, one of the, as one of the largest domestic humanitarian organizations in the U.S., we operate programs across about 4,000 sites. Um, 700 programs serve refugees and migrants. Um, we serve about 600,000 refugees, asylees, migrants, and undocumented people in our programs. Um, the government um, funding has diminished significantly but Catholic Charities will never turn a human being away. Recently, our government has initiated additional criteria that further restricts the admission of asylees and migrants, especially migrants. This is a point system called a public charge. So I'll say a little bit about that later, but not a lot. Uh, but in summary, it just adds to the difficulty of gaining admission to this country. That all being said, I think that for us, the most important thing that needs to happen in our own hearts and minds and souls is that we must shatter our stereotypes of people who come to our country in need of safety and security for themselves and for their children. The personal journey toward openness of heart openness of heart toward the stranger who doesn't speak my language, doesn't look like me, uh, doesn't come from my background. That journey is often a very difficult one. My first real encounter with refugees happened about 30 years ago when I was ministering in Toronto. I, had ne I must admit, I had never actually met a refugee or migrant. I'm ashamed to say I came from a rather uh, homogenous suburban, uh, suburban uh, background uh, when I entered the, uh, the order and uh, was uh, never really in contact with people who had had to run for their lives. I can remember to this day the actual date. It was December 23rd. And as usual in Canada, it was a very cold night. We received a call at our Dominican house from the immigration officials at Pearson Airport who told us that a Geneva Convention asylum couple had just arrived from Romania and had nowhere to go for the night. Could we help? Of course we said we would help them. That night, we were able to provide them with a place to stay. They spoke no English. Um, it was a challenge. My French was terrible, and that was the closest language we had in common. Uh, but we, we, made, we made it through that evening. It was Christmas time, and we wanted them to have a Christmas. So uh, as they were, we found a, a place for them to stay besides our community, uh, we, we invited them to come to our home for dinner and spend Christmas with them and give them some small gifts. And I recall one of my former classmates from the University of Toronto, who was about the same build as the refugee man, and I called him up and I uh, asked him if he had any clothes to spare, because men's clothes weren't long in the convent, you know. So, <laughs> and especially because his, his preliminary asylum hearing was coming up. So my classmate arrived at our house with a brand new hand-sewn Italian suit, shirt, tie, shoes, everything. And he said simply, 
Every man needs his dignity. Every man needs a good suit. So the young Romanian um, man was overwhelmed. We were able to give the woman some clothes as well. That wasn't as hard of a task. <laughs> But as their story began to unfold, we learned that the couple had run for their lives during the Ceausescu regime. The Romanian man was an engineer. His wife was a, a nationally renowned musician. She was a pianist, concert pianist. Both of them had been se uh, severely tortured. They were in their 20s. The young woman, uh, as part of the torture, had her hands broken by the guards so she could never play the piano again. The engineer had gone through such horrific torture that he could not even tell his wife what had happened to him. I still don't know what happened to him. Little by little, though, with the support and the care of many people, they began to heal. I think when we look into the eyes of someone who suffered so much, we can't help but be drawn closer into the passion. For me, it, was for the, it really was the first time I came to the realization that every refugee or migrant or asylee would far more want to stay in their home country, but situations have made it impossible for them. I had harbored a bias that I'm not at all proud of, thinking that refugees and migrants were simply people looking for a step up or a handout. I'm ashamed of that. 30 years ago, God knew that it was time to shake me to my core. I now had met refugees who were just like me, people from very good families, self-sufficient, gainfully employed professionals, but unlike me, terrified for their very lives. Then I began to think, what would I do if I had to leave my country and run for my life? What if I had to depend upon strangers to help me, to open the door to me? As a result of my experience with the two Romanians, I began to do pro bono clinical work with the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. I will admit to you that I continue to find it very painful when I'm privileged to receive the stories of those who have suffered so enormously and lost everything, including their country. As Pope Francis so poignantly reminds us, migrants and refugees are not pawns on the chessboard of humanity. They are children, women, and men who leave or who are forced to leave their homes for various reasons, who share a legitimate desire for knowing and having, but above all, for being more. Pope Francis spoke that uh, to the World Day of Migrants and Refugees in 2013. Migrants and refugees are truly our sisters and brothers. They're not freeloaders. They've literally run for their lives, and they come to us, to our parishes, to our Catholic communities, to Catholic charities. Um, they come to us in need of help. And sometimes I think the best help that we can provide is to listen to their stories, as painful as those stories may be. Calling people by their names, letting them know that we're open to welcoming them and being a companion along their journey toward cultural integration. Sometimes we can't even use verbal language, and it's the language of the heart that is conveyed through our actions, our respect, even through our tears. Whether as members of a faith community and followers of the gospel, or as part of the large human fa family, or as part of the family of Catholic Charities workers, we're all part of a long tradition that calls us to extend mercy and compassion to our sisters and brothers who so desperately need us. As followers of the gospel, we sometimes need to take risks. Two and a half years ago, the entire Ministry of Catholic Charities, over 164 agencies in um, with 58,000 employees across the continental United States and territories. It was a lot of people. 
uh, and 250,000 volunteers, we engaged in a process of theological reflection focused on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Our reflection led us to identify strategic priorities, the care of refugees and migrants being one of those priorities that would inform our ministry for these years to come. This communal reflection on the parable of the Good Samaritan challenged us to ask the question, who right now is lying by the side of the road? Who are those people whom others walk past and refuse to help? We might ask, in other words, who are the despised, the forgotten, the outsiders, the poverty-stricken, the beaten up or the tortured, who cry out to us for help, who cry out and others may walk past because they're afraid or they don't know what to do, they're intimidated. A more personal part of that reflective process concerns asking ourselves, am I one of the priests or the Levites who passed by? Am I one of the, am I perhaps an innkeeper who gave this stranger shelter and some time to recover? Am I the Samaritan who stopped and helped? I think if we're honest with ourselves, there have been times when we've been one of all three of those characters. The, the person along the side of the street who's homeless and begging for money, a handout, and walking across the road, or perhaps not seeing them in the face, looking at them eye to eye, or being willing to engage them, whatever it is. It's not easy to realize that sometimes each of us can be blind to suffering, or too busy to stop, or too frightened to approach someone who is so different from us. Tending to the stranger, the suffering stranger, is not easy work. It calls each of us, myself included, to examine the secret prejudices and confront our biases toward those who may not look like us or sound like us. But no one ever told us that living the gospel was easy. I often wonder whether we Christians and we Catholic Christians might have become too acclimated to the prevailing national mood toward migrants and lost our focus on the heart of Jesus' message in Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. In the beautiful yet challenging statement, welcoming the stranger among us, unity in diversity, the U.S. bishops wrote, the presence of so many people, of so many different cultures and religions in so many parts of the United States has challenged us as a church to a profound conversion so that we can become truly a sacrament of unity as Catholics, we are called to take concrete measures to overcome the misunderstanding, ignorance, competition, and fear that stand in the way of genuinely welcoming the stranger in our midst and enjoying the communion that is our destiny as children of God. That's a powerful statement and one that hopefully we all take to heart, uh, this Lenten time especially. This is really the essence of the ongoing work of the conversion of our hearts. As a church, we're being called to counter prevalent strains of separatism, bigotry, and xenophobia with compassion, mercy, and welcome. As I said when I began, we're surrounded by so much disturbing rhetoric, so much anger and vitriol, so much cruelty that has permeated our civic society and sadly has even crept at times into our own church. It's easy to become disillusioned. But this afternoon, I want to share this very special story of human kindness and compassion. This is an ongoing, it's still unfolding, incredible true story of what I refer to as transcontinental human goodness. 
The story begins in Honduras in 2017. And I can use the brother's name now because they are now safe. Uh, when we planned this, I didn't know whether I could use their names and how uh, uh, kind, of imp you know, kind of abstract I had to be about the story, but I can tell you the story uh, because they're safe. Two brothers, Carlos and Edwin, were caught in a gang shootout. During that event, Carlos, the younger brother, he's 21, was shot three times, one bullet lodging in his spine and causing him now to be paralyzed from the waist down and in a wheelchair. What made matters worse was the shooter was a dirty cop. Carlos identified the cop, and as a result, the cop went to jail. That having happened, a hit was taken out on the two brothers' families by one of the drug gangs involved in the incident. Edwin, the older brother, who's 29, uh, and Carlos were faced with having to make a difficult decision to leave Honduras, seek asylum in the U.S. For one year, Edwin pushed his brother Carlos in his wheelchair from Honduras across all of Mexico and finally into the United States. Their 2,000 mile journey took them one full year of walking. No one would offer them a ride because Carlos was in a wheelchair. When they finally reached the U.S. border, the wheelchair was in shreds, and they were in very rough shape. Father Sean Carroll, who a number of faculty and students have visited um, at, the, uh, at the border, uh, and his staff at the Kino Border Initiative in Mexico, helped the two brothers, helped them get ready to cross into the U.S. When they crossed into Nogales, Arizona, they were put into detention. And after two weeks in detention, uh, they, were, they were ankle braceleted and released. They were loaded into a white, unmarked van that had its windows covered. They were not told where they were being taken. They were terrified that they were going to be returned to Mexico, or worse. Instead, they found themselves in the middle of a neighborhood at a respite house, Casa Alitas, run by Catholic Charities. There they would be given clean food, clean, they would be in food, clean clothing, basic hygiene supplies, and a bus ticket to a host family. It just so happened that as they arrived, some of the staff from the national office had gone down as reinforcements to, and volunteers to help at Casa Alitas and met the two brothers. So that's how our national office got involved with them. When the host family found out that the, one of the brothers was in a wheelchair and that gang violence was the cause, they refused to take them in. Casa Alitas Catholic Charity staff tried and tried to find some place that would take them in. And so our staff who, from the national office who were down there let me know about it. I said, find out if uh, the brothers have to be in uh, Arizona or can they go somewhere else? And the story came back, no, they could go anywhere if they had a host family. So, uh, they, the brothers had been told that they had to find a host family quickly or ICE was going to return them. So we were kind of desperate. So at 8 o'clock in the morning, I decide, okay, I'm calling my Dominican brother, the provincial of the Dominicans in Chicago, and said, Jimmy, do you have a house that you could care for these two brothers? And Jim said, let me get back to you in an hour. So he consulted with the community. Uh, and a 21 uh, retired Dominican friars said they would be thrilled to welcome them to their community. 
And Jim said, well, do you know how long it's going to be? And I said, no. Um, I said, I could have sent them to Adrian, Michigan, but I thought that 250 grandma nuns probably was a little much. So, um, you know, so I said, it could be two weeks, four weeks, it could be a month, I don't know. Uh, instead, it turned out to be four months. In a red, in, so in a, uh, we, so we located the way to get them there. Uh, some Catholic charities in, in Arizona worked with TSA, believe it or not, who waived some rules and got the two brothers on an airplane so they didn't have to take a bus um, because it would have been very hard for Carlos to manage with uh, not being able to move very easily. So the understanding supervisor helped them get on a plane. They were met by the Dominicans in Chicago, brought to a community where they were welcomed by now 21 grandpas. Uh, so these, uh, these men were absolutely extraordinary. They said, this is what our life is about. It's who we are. We need to be able to welcome the stranger. They were not the folks that walked to the other side of the road. They welcomed them. Not only that, they were wonderful, uh, wonderful supportive figures to the brothers. It turned out half of the community spoke Spanish. Uh, they remembered their Spanish and they engaged them and it was, a, it was great. So the, the examples of human kindness in this uh, real life Good Samaritans, stunning to me. The people along the way in Mexico who gave them food, the older brother who pushed his kid brother an entire year across Mexico, the people at the Kino border initiative in Nogales, Sonora, who cared for them when they were so bereft having crossed all of that land, the staff at Casa Alitas, their colleagues from our national office in Alexandria, the TSA supervisor who helped them board the plane, the 21 friars. These are faces of human goodness and kindness and mercy. I would say these are faces of the Christ. As the months went on, because it went for four months, the brothers had been given a hearing date of, Jul of January 22nd. The US government was drafting more stringent criteria for asylum. People fleeing, as I mentioned, gang violence uh, would likely not be considered for asylum. Uh, people also who would depend on government programs called a public charge like Medicaid or food stamps or education or unemployment support or um, anything that would take from government taxpayer money to support them or who would likely become a burden on the, on the taxpayer uh, would be refused, likely to be refused because it, it is a point system. So by this time, the brothers had spent three months with the Dominicans. It was December 2018. We knew the brothers would be hit heavily by the public charge ruling. So they were, they were uneducated. They were illiterate. One needed medical care. They would need housing. They would need food stamps. They would need language. All of us were worried because the brothers we knew would likely be killed if they had been returned to Honduras. So here's the next part of this human goodness. I called a friend of mine who's a Canadian bishop. And I said, what, where would you advise someone to cross into Canada to ask for asylum? And he told me where, which I will not say aloud. Uh, and when I called him, uh, he was actually in Rome at the uh, Youth Synod. And he called me from Rome and he said, he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, we got a case and I need your help. And he said, oh, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll work with you. He said, I'll call you when I get back from Rome, which he did. So the brothers, meanwhile, we went in to talk with the brothers. I went uh, to Chicago. We had a meeting with the brothers. Um, they were terrified because everything that they heard said that they were likely to be deported. And they were begging God for a sign of what to do. Should they run? Should they go back to Mexico? Should they hide in Mexico? What should they do? 
And when we talked to them about this option of going to Canada, they both began to cry. So after that poignant meeting, the brothers had a discussion privately and made the decision that they would go to Canada where their chances for asylum would be upwards of 60% versus under 11% in the United States. They had to make their decision while their, their documents were valid before their January hearing. So both the brothers and the Dominicans had formed a strong bond and it would be painful for the Dominican friars to say goodbye and painful for the two young men to leave. But the chances of staying were too daunting and everybody recognized that. The brothers spent Christmas with the Dominicans and on December 29th, the Dominicans drove them toward Canada where a quasi underground railroad is basically in effect on this side of our side of the border with people who, give, who uh, helped take the brothers to the actual border crossing so it wouldn't implicate either the Dominicans or Catholic Charities, even though it was all legal. Uh, it was New Year's Eve. We were worried sick. I'm texting the bishop in Canada on New Year's Eve. Now, just think about this for a minute. You know, this is foreign to me that a bishop is actually going to answer the text messages at um, 11 o'clock at night on New Year's Eve. And, and the Dominican priests who had driven them were, were telling me quietly that they thought they were going to throw up. They were so nervous. <laughs> and so the bishop is saying, no, it's going to be all right. They're going to be all right. Don't worry. We'll be there. So he had arranged that there would be people who would meet them when they crossed the border and turn themselves in for, uh, as, as asylees. They were again placed in detention, a place that's more like a YMCA than a cage um, they were given a private room with a bath and a shower, a medical checkup, and meals. Five days later, they were removed from detention, moved to a temporary facility, and uh, now they are living uh, in a, a handicap-accessible apartment unit, um, and they're receiving support, um, about $1,400 a month, from the Canadian government. The bishop visits them, and people from a Spanish-speaking parish are preparing furnishings and providing emotional support for them. They continue to be supported and will continue to be supported until, uh, until the determination is made that they can stay in Canada, which we are hopeful that they will be. So again, uh, human goodness stuns us. People who in some way live the parable of the Good Samaritan. The American people on the U.S. side of the border who are working to assist refugees and migrants gain safe entry into Canada. The Canadian border guard who treated them with dignity. The nurse in the Canadian detention facility who loaned them her phone charger cord so they could let us and the Dominican men know that they were safe that Canadian bishop who answered the phone all night long on, um, on New Year's Eve, and all the people in that diocese in Canada who are accompanying them through the frigid winter time of Canada. I'm reminded of Pope Francis's comments when he visited the sixth station of the cross with Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. Pope Francis says, we instinctively try to run away from suffering because suffering is repugnant to us. We come across so many faces disfigured by the afflictions of life and all too often we turn away. How can we not see the face of the Lord in the face of the millions of exiles, refugees, migrants, and displaced persons who are fleeing in desperation from the horror of war persecution, and dictatorship. For every one of them, each with a unique face, God reveals himself always as the one who courageously comes to our aid. That was in March of 2016. So very, very good people across the entire continent, from uh, Latin America, through Mexico, the United States, and into Canada, did not run away from these men. 
And in the truest sense, they were the face of the Christ to them. And they saved their lives. They're only two of hundreds of thousands of people, but they're two lives saved. The brothers have been broken. They've suffered greatly, but they're beginning to heal. They long for their families to join them. Their families are in the caravans somewhere. But know that that's going to be a ways off. Those of us who work within the Catholic community are anticipating more government actions to restrict immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers wanting to enter our country. So we do find ourselves legitimately demoralized. But when we meet the people, when we listen to their stories, and we realize they're no different from you and I, that these are wonderful human beings who deserve kindness, a sense of hope, and a hand to get them to safety. All of that disillusionment seems to pale. So I would say, regardless of our political leanings, I simply want to invite us all, this Lenten time, to allow the compassion of the Crucified One to enter our hearts and to hold in prayer all those who are dispossessed and frightened this day, this night, and to stretch ourselves whenever we can, to be clear-eyed, kind, merciful, good Samaritans. Thanks.